Hi guys. Hope you've taken the trouble to look at the other sessions, uh, 5 and 6 on diabetes. We have now got to session 7, head trauma. And I know that traumas happen all the time, but especially around the holidays, July the 4th is coming up, we're more than likely to see trauma. Some of the things we're going to learn today about things like uh, the golden hour, epidural versus subdural bleeding, intracranial pressure, herniation, and basal skull fractures, and preventing trauma also. Okay, let's get started on uh, what happens at the trauma scene. Well, we all know that traumas happen anywhere, anytime, any time of day. You can never predict when a trauma is going to happen, but knowing what to do is the most important thing. Here in number one, we can see that uh, this is an obvious trauma scene. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Adam Cowley uh, emphasized, he was the one who initiated what was called the golden hour. The golden hour is the most crucial hour after a patient has a trauma. The management of that patient is going to say a lot for how things progress. And one of the things that's emphasized in that hour is airway management. It's very important to manage the airway. You may spend all the time fixing the wrist or fixing that broken leg and then you turn around and that patient's not breathing and it's too late. So airway management is of paramount importance. Then we move on to number two. You may not be familiar with what an ambu bag is. An ambu bag is used to literally bag that patient and give them oxygen. First, you have to have an airway in place, and at one end it's connected to the patient. The other end, it's connected to oxygen, and you squeeze air into that patient until they can breathe on their own, or they're put on a ventilator. It's just a stopgap. You cannot do it for very long. It's very tiring after a while. And of course, we give things like IV fluids and so at the trauma scene. Next, another very important matter that has to be discussed is what happens when you have a trauma patient. Nobody knows for certain if that patient has a broken neck or any fractures of the spine. So one of the things that you have to take care of is immobilizing the spine until you're certain that that patient, by x-rays and the doctor's consent, the collars and the board can be taken away. So usually, typically what happens, the patient is placed on a board, the spine is immobilized, cervical collar is put in place because you want to prevent permanent damage. Uh, transportation to the trauma center. Now, there are different levels of trauma centers. There are trauma centers that barely do any traumas. They don't see that many. But then what you have is called the level one trauma center where you have an ER doctor on call 24 hours a day. That is the type of trauma center that can handle really severe traumas. Some of these patients may have to be airlifted. Learn more about this topic by reading, uh, going to dearnurses.com and reading about trauma and brain injury. We're going to talk a lot about, a little more now about what happens when injury happens to the brain. When the brain becomes injured, there are many different ways it can be injured. You might have bleeding under the actual layers, what we call the uh, meninges which cover the brain. You may have bleeding above the meningeal covering. You may have bleeding inside the ventricles where cerebral spinal fluid is produced. Whatever the situation, once it's established what's happened to that patient, it's important. The doctor will usually decide what the, uh, the treatment is. Now let's talk a little about, we can see here that there are four traumas here. We have this car accident, we've got this young man, a ball strikes him in the head, and I know it may look innocent, but you can have quite a traumatic event occurring from this. Then you've got this gentleman on a ladder, he's eventually going to fall. This lady's lying on the ground. In the case of this lady, she does a lot of drinking and she falls and hits her head. She might very readily have a chronic bleed, which is a subdural bleed, which occurs under the dura mater. There are three coverings to the brain. We have the dura, the pia, and the arachnoid mater. The arachnoid is the one that's closest to the brain and the pia in the middle. And the dura mater is the outermost and the most toughest one, which is closest to the skull. But what happens is the bleed might just be under that dura mater. It's called a subdural bleed. Usually those are venous bleeds, and they are very chronic, and they're very, very slow, and they may go on and on and on until that patient actually just slips away and goes into a coma without anyone realizing what is happening. 
very often happen with patients who do a lot of drinking and falling and hit it, hitting their heads. Then we have what is called epidural bleeding. Hematoma may form. A hematoma, by the way, is a collection of blood. So you have a hematoma forming above the dura mater. This is an epidural bleed. Typically, these bleeds are arterial bleeds, so you get more forceful bleeding. So these patients may have a brief period of unconsciousness. They come to, then they go out again. One thing I wanted you to know about subdural bleeds, because they're chronic and slow bleeding, unless otherwise stated, typically the doctor has orders the head of bed to be flat so that you don't have gravity causing a lot of blood to happen all at the same time. Then we're going to talk about intracranial pressure. Uh, there are some ways you can identify intracranial pressure even if you don't have that ICP monitoring going on. I know in the intensive care typically you'd have intracranial pressure, you can tell when the pressure is high and how, but sometimes if you pick up someone in the field you may not be able to tell because you don't have that monitor on them. Well, one of the ways you can tell with that patient, sometimes a fixed and dilated pupil is a sign of rising intracranial pressure. Another thing you might notice is the neurological status of that patient. That patient may be very lethargic, very hard to arouse, they've got the fixed and dilated pupil, then they have this really, uh, their breathing, their respirations may be very shallow, very noisy. You try to arouse them and talk to them, you get this snoring, and you're not really getting a good response. And it is very important to note that the brain actually has around it the skull, which is solid bone. And if the brain should swell from any kind of injury, there's not much room for it to expand within that skull. So what possibly can happen if it's not taken care of in time? We get something called herniation when the brain finds a path outside of the skull and goes through the foramen magnum at the base of the skull. So you don't want that to happen. You want to pay as much attention as you can when you have a traumatic injury, even if that patient seems like he's doing okay for the moment. Then we want to talk a little about basal skull fracture. A basal skull fracture is just what you got, a fracture at the base of the skull. And some of the warning signs, you get things like raccoon's eyes, which is bleeding into the soft tissue around the eyes. You may also have it at the back of the air, or you might just get coming out of the nose. You might have cerebrospinal fluid coming out of the nose because of that crack in the base of the skull. And so we're going to talk about uh, preventing trauma. There are ways that trauma can prevent it. We know like wearing a seat belt. Uh, people with poor vision should uh, be discouraged from driving. Drinking alcohol is another don't drink and drive. And be careful you're not that nurse who becomes a trauma within a trauma who was rushing off to the emergency room. And what happened? She slid in the soapy water and became the next trauma. So do be careful now. And then, of course, you've got this nurse. If you've ever been in a situation where you've seen someone uh, defibrillate a patient, she gets the paddles out. But what happens next is shocking. She takes those paddles and directs them to the person standing next to her. She got a bit distracted. So do be careful that you do not create what is called trauma within a trauma. And we're going to have more issues for you the next time on trauma. So have a great week. And thanks again for listening. Goodbye.